Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Halpenny. I'm uh, president of the Irish Landscape Institute, and you're very welcome today to the next in our series of uh, lunchtime webinars. And the subject today is close to a lot of our hearts. It's uh, the subject of rewilding, which is great to see coming up the, um, I suppose, the, the charts in terms of its, its prominence. And we have, we're I'm delighted uh, on your behalf to welcome uh, to our presentation today, Paul Jepson uh, from EcoSolus Limited. And Paul is Nature Recovery Lead with EcoSolus Limited, a leading ecological consultancy in the UK. And his expertise is around rewilding and that his consultancy offers a wide range of rewilding and nature recovery services. Uh, and Paul has a particular interest in the intersection of rewilding technology and finance. He started his career in urban nature restoration uh, and then was uh, a lead in BirdLife International Indonesia program. Uh, and then directing uh, Oxford University's MSc and MPhil in biodiversity conservation and management. He is an expert in conservation governance and has published collections of academic and popular articles on wildlife trade, protected areas, rewilding policy, conservation, culture, economics, and on extinction and flagship species theory. He's a former member of U U the Rewilding Europe Supervisory Group and his latest book, Rewilding, The Radical New Science of Ecological Recovery, is receiving very positive reviews in the Financial Times and elsewhere. So uh, really privileged to have Paul with us today. Uh, he'll speak for about 35 minutes and then we'll get uh, a chance uh, to, to uh, uh, give some of our ideas and questions and um, you get a chance to put your hands up or put your questions in the chat and I'll call you in uh, one after the other. So Paul, take it away. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kevin. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from a rainy Oxford. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, online and to um, to have this opportunity to, to give you my take uh, on rewilding. So I'll just give me a second while I just share my screen. Um, let's hope that's the, uh, the full screen which is coming through to you. I think it is. That's, um, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So as Kevin indicated, I, I, I've been involved in, um, in the rewilding movement since, um, since around 2006 now, when I, when I first took my students at Oxford over to the Netherlands to see what was going on there uh, in, in rewilding. And um, I suppose I spent, you know, the years since sort of teaching and researching rewilding. And now for the last three years or two years since I joined EcoSoothis, I've been actively involved in, in trying to do it, trying to put it into to practice. And I was mentioning earlier, it's been lovely to have this opportunity to think about the relationship between rewilding and, and landscape design. What I'm planning to do in this, this talk is, is really three things. I want to give you a sort of a brief overview of rewilding. I'd then like to um, talk about some of the, some of the science advice, advances, particularly the ecological science adv advances, which are, are underpinning the rewilding approach. I'll then go on to characterize that approach and illustrate it uh, with three case studies, and I hope it's those case studies which will, you know, really prompt a prompt a good um, a good discussion, if you, if you like. So perhaps the first thing uh, to mention is that, at least in Britain, rewild and, and the scientific world, rewilding is, is becoming mainstream. It's 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 moved from this sort of fringe discussion, you know, this sort of progressive, exciting discussion, into both the scientific and popular. Uh, mainstream. I mean, the, 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 the chart on the left is just to show the exponential rise in scientific papers, which, which use the word rewilding. And rewilding in science has become the, the label, if you like, for this sort of discourse on new approaches to nature conservation, and in particular, uh, approaches to ecosystem restoration, and the, the, the societal and, and nature benefits which could come for it. But also in popular discourse, it's become associated with these sort of, sometimes people call it the eco-optimism literature, these, these very sort of positive accounts of, of futures that uh, could become. You know, you may have heard of the, or you may have read the, 
the, the, the really sort of celebrated book by Isabella Tree on the rewilding at NET. There's other books that are rebirthing by Benedict MacDonald, which sort of look at the history of where we've come from and just start imagining where we could go to in, in, um, in 2050 or, or 20, 2040. Often people push us for a, for a definition of rewilding and defining rewilding, it's, it's, sometimes it's like, you know, I, I grew up in the punk area. Could we actually ever define punk rock? You know, we know it's a cultural force, but it's a little bit hard to, to define. Anyhow, this is a sort of paraphrase definition of rewilding, which I write rather like. And it's thinking of rewilding as spaces of innovation, spaces of in, in, innovation conceptually in conservation philo philosophy, theory, science, but also spaces of innovation in nature conservation management. And it's characterized by this desire to restore and recover ecosystem processes. Sometimes this is called the self-willed ecosystems, that you know, ecosystems can function and can determine their own futures, the process part of it. And that's very much linked to what we now call nature-based solutions as well. It's done at various scales, but it's often involves the reintroduction or the introduction of what we call functional species, species which have a role within uh, ecosystems, and also about restoring diet processes of natural uh, disturbance. That will become a bit clearer when I get onto the science uh, on it. But if I could just leave that at the moment, that's the sort of. For me, this is what captures rewilding at the moment. It is an innovation space. Nothing is fixed at the moment. It's a fresh way of thinking and looking at things. It also sig signifies quite a shift in the conservation movement from a defensive focus on nature protection to a proactive and perhaps more ambitious agenda of ecosystem recovery. And one of, the, one of the papers I published a couple of years ago, I was sort of reflecting when I was listening and involved in rewilding or rewilding projects, that they weren't telling the same story or the same narrative as traditional environmental conservation. So there is this idea that in rewilding, we're seeing the emergence of a 21st century narrative. One which, you know, we know the classic environmental narrative, you know, nature's getting worse, apocalypse catastrophe looms, you know, we blame polluting industries, our own sort of fecundity and, you know, immoral ways of corporates and other ways, and we pressure others uh, to try and make a change. It's, it's quite an anxiety-based narrative. Within rewilding, though, we're seeing a narrative which is much more about, uh, it's more hopeful and empowering. It always has these elements of people awakening. Wow, I didn't realise that. God, can that happen? Oh, let's just make, let's just get going. Let's just do something rather than waiting for others to do it. And through that, not only recovering nature, but recovering a sense of meaning and purpose in, in one's own lives as well. So there's an idea that we're, we're beginning, rewilding is sort of shaping or it expresses uh, a new narrative, a new more hopeful and confident environmental narrative. I think another thing really important, I'm, I'm a geographer, so you'll see where this one's coming from, is that rewilding or rewilding science and principles it's emerged in different parts of the world, in different contexts, and at different times over the last 20 or 30 uh, years. And the, the term rewilding was actually coined in the US, and it was coined uh, in association with progressive agendas to create big ecosystems and reintroduce wolves. That label rewilding is now being assigned or adopted by lots of other projects which sort of shame, uh, share the same principles, but not necessarily the sh same aims. So it's always a bit of, you know, in, in the UK media, maybe it's the same in, in Ireland, that uh, they thought rewilding was all about reintroducing wolves. There's actually very few rewilders I know in Europe who even suggest reintroducing wolves. Um, our form of rewilding or the versions of rewilding which are shaping rewilding in, in Europe and, uh, and Britain and, and maybe will shape them in, in Ireland are much more linked to, to rewilding which came out of ideas of nature development, uh, the farm rewilding models we're seeing in, in England with NEP at the moment. 
And because they came from European conservationists who were working internationally, there's flows of ideas between the, with the wildlife economy models, amazing restoration models in Southern Africa after a, apartheid, and, uh, and also you know, a look over to these models in, in the East as well. So our version of rewilding, or the version of rewilding which I've been involved in, the European rewilding movement is involved in, it's actually quite a little bit distant from the American wilderness version um, of rewilding. I mentioned also that, that rewilding uh, expresses these, these advances in ecological theory and what we now call interdisciplinary conservation science. And interestingly, the, the science has really interacted with, with pioneer practice, some, some of the pioneer practice I was just showing you in that, that last slide, and I'll come on to a, um, a little bit more. And now I'd just like to give you sort of a very brief flavour of what those, uh, some of those scientific advances or the advances in, 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 in theory. I think, I don't know how much you guys are into technology, but what, one of the things which, which was just great when I was in the university was seeing how our ability to understand ecosystems was really developing with the aid of technology. And that we now have a much better understanding of the evolution of our contemporary ecosystems. And, you know, the story is that this goes back 20, 40 million years when the Earth, the planet was in this very dynamic period of volcanoes, tectonic activity. And that enabled grasslands to, the disturbance it created, enabled grasslands to get a hold, it knocked back the woody vegetation, the trees. You know, it, it, previous to that, a so-called hothouse uh, planet of it. And as grasslands expanded, the, uh, the, the herbivores moved out of the forest, and then the mega herbivores, the megafauna as we now, now know it, evolved. And the mega herbivores in, and the grasslands co-evolved and sort of came into this dynamic interaction with, uh, with the woody vegetation. So over most of the planet, over and vast swathes of, and all of Europe, the, the habitat of uh, up until 10 to 15,000 years ago were these mosaic um, landscapes of megafauna, grasslands, forest groves, thickets, and so forth. And this dynamic interaction created huge microhabitat diversity, and that in turn created you know, fantastic species diversity and biological abundance. And that's the sort of, if you like, the, the baselines we're now understanding. It's a bit more complicated than the story I've just told you, but that's the core of the, if you like, the insights which are feeding, uh, feeding and rewilding uh, um, um, science. And that, that word interactions is key there. And then as humans expanded over the planets, we had these processes which came along. The first is what's called the overkill hypothesis, where humans, as they spread into, um, into Europe, but particularly into, uh, into, into Russia and across into, uh, into the Americas, they were, they were feeding off these mega herbivores. And the mega herbivores just couldn't take the hunting pressure. So their populations over hundreds of years, but not thousands of years, collapsed. Then we had processes of taming, processes of draining the landscape, uh, you know, 17th, 16th, 17th century, processes of ordering the landscape. And then in this last 50 years, we've had processes of really industrializing the landscape. And this has just caused, you know, over the millennia, caused downgrading of that microhabitat diversity of the interactions in ecosystems and overall downgrading of ecosystems and the emerging properties of biodiversity and, um, and bioabundance. However, it wasn't all bad because human agriculture, um, particularly the sort of livestock management, the rotational, you know, cropping and livestock in it, that sort of mixed farming type models, that actually quite that mimics quite a lot of the herbivore grassland forest disturbance dynamics of the of our natural ecosystems if you like so in many areas of the world particularly in western europe we had um or europe more, more generally we had quite you know the ecosystems were, were still quite rich they were still vibrant they were still functioning albeit not maybe at the at the top level but they were still doing still still doing uh, well and ecosystems or nature became an object of, um, of interest, of scientific interest, of cultural interest um, in, during the, the Victorian era around the, you know, with all of the talks around 
Darwinism. And naturalists started going out into the cities and the nature they, they met was this, this pastoral nature of mixed farming. And it seemed natural to them. It seemed, it seemed you know, innocent and more pure than the, than the vices of the industrial cities. But they were going in with the Victorian natural history classification mind. That's what it was all about there. You know, that's the museum type, the rise of museums. And they did the same thing in nature. They classified nat the nature they found in the 1950s, uh, sorry, 1870s, 1880s. And that enabled us to, when it came later, when we needed to protect nature, to create very strong laws. You could specify different types of habitat, different types of species, those which were under threat, those which needed protected, and those which should be restored. And that is the way our nature conservation has functioned, you know, functioned since. It's what we call a compositionalist approach. We focus on the units of nature and the particular assemblies of of plant species and so forth. So that's, that's sort of okay, but another key insight, or, or if you like rewilding theory has borrowed this from fisheries, is the notion of the shifting baseline syndrome. The idea that the, the natures we experience in our youth are the natures we, we assume are natural and the levels of bioabundance and biodiversity we experience in our youth or study in our youth, we assume those to be natural. Unfortunately, these ongoing processes of, of human modification, management of the landscape, uh, and, and the, the internal processes of, of ecosystem deassembly de mean that every new generation experiences and takes for natural um, a, an ever more degraded landscape. And we're now at the stage where uh, ecosystems are a low ebb, but we've come to cherish and conserve an ever more degraded nature. And we've come to institutionalize the protection, management and restoration of an ever more degraded nature. And part of what rewilding is about is saying, hey, just let's take stock of this and actually let's try and reset our expectations of the natural and, and, you know, and our ambitions of what nature can become. Now, for, well, not fortunately, but in the last two or three years, all of these sort of ideas in, in rewild in the science and practice have sort of consolidated into a theoretical ar architecture of how we might upgrade ecosystems. And the recognition actually that giving ecosystems an up upgrade is a cultural and policy choice. We can do it if we want to do it. We now have the, we have the technology, we have the science. And it's really saying that, and I think this is what hopefully where we're sort of getting over into a bit landscape design principles and the, the link with rewilding design principles is really the key thing is to try and re-expand um, landscapes on three axes. So re-expanding the potential for dispersal of species across landscapes. This is a, you know, we've been doing this a bit in terms of ecological network mapping. Um, Re-establishing forms of random disturbance. And this one's really interesting. When you look at, certainly when I look at the landscapes around, you know, where I am in England, you realize that there's hardly any natural disturbance in it. You know, all the rivers are canalized. There's no sort of braiding going on. Um, because of mechanized agriculture, there aren't those sort of messy, scruffy, scuffed bits in farms or whatever. You, you say, God, actually, the landscapes have become very static. So, we, you know, increasing disturbance is another one. And then the other bit is called trophic complexity, which is basically about re-expanding the web of life. And this goes to the, the sort of uh, spinning top graphic here, which is this understanding that things we may value in nature, like bioabundance, biodiversity, ecosystem functions, these are all emerging properties of interactions between the soil, the vegetation, and the biota in all of that. But one of the key insights of rewilding uh, science, and I'll come back to this later, is um, again, but I've already touched on it, is the massive role of mega herbivores in the functioning of contemporary ecosystems and therefore in the restoration of functioning ecosystems. So a lot of rewilding is about herbivores. But just before I go on to that, um, it might be useful just to summarise that distinction as, as we see it between conventional nature conservation, what we've been doing now, and rewilding. So conventional nature conservation is very much focused on uh, 
maintaining it and managing, protecting, restoring those characteristic habitats, plant assemblages, and their species associations, faunal associations, which were described back in the 1970s or specified in the 1970s in law and first described by the Victorian naturalists. Rewilding is about recovering those interactions between different aspects or components or attributes of an ecosystem and then letting nature lead. So keeping your hands in the pocket, saying like, put things in place and then we'll let nature lead. So, and then it's really about, it's not about trying to, you know, deliver law in a sense or targets. It's about them working with the restored forces of nature and those and linking those with society and economy to create something which is good for us all, to put it simply. So I sort of indicated that, that rewilding as it's, as it's formulated in, 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 in Europe is more about herbivores than predators uh, on it. And this is because of this, this massive functional role of, of, of herbivores. You know, like if you think of a cow, it's a sort of, it's a walking bulldozer, it's a walking lawnmower, and it's a walking um, defecator on it. And it's just, it's just constantly doing things uh, within the ecosystem, which creates all of those niches for other things to, to you know, to, to live, basically. These may be in the soil, they may be in the grasslands, they may be in the, in the, uh, in the mosaics. And then something we tend to forget, of course, is that the herbivores, when they die, they became a, a located abundant food resource, which then supported uh, a whole scavenger ecology and created niches and resources for species, you know, often uh, at that very tough time of year, um, February, March uh, type of year. So a lot of what European rewilding is about is reassembling uh, herbivore guilds. And we're quite lucky in Europe, and uh, I want, so I'm just checking the time here, actually. Uh, yeah, um, and I won't go into this too much. We can get into this in the, in the questions, but we actually, we still have quite a large set of the herbivores, which were here um, before they started getting, uh, the population started getting uh, decimated by human uh, actions. The interesting thing we have in, in Europe is that some of the herbivores, which we still have, we now only know as domestic species. You know, we've forgotten we had wild horses, we've forgotten we had water buffalo, we've forgotten we had aurochs, you know, we, we now just call them, you know, a cow, a horse and a buffalo or some. Other species, which we, we know about as wild animals, we think are American, such as the bison, whereas actually they're a native uh, European species. And I think this gives us a great opportunity or makes, for me, makes rewilding interesting because we can reassemble the, the herbivore guilds from this blend of domestic and wild species. It does actually create some some policy challenges, which we may like to come back to um, come back to later. So I'd now like to move on to to the rewilding approach and uh, and get into some of the the practice on it. I've sort of given you a flavour of what uh, what rewilding might be is and some of the science uh, behind it. And I've also mentioned that that science is constantly interplaying with with pioneer projects which are creating this, this, this rewilding uh, approach. About, uh, not about two years ago, last October, um, sort of leading rewilding practitioners from across those, those projects came together in um, uh, Cuenca, in, uh, is that how you say Cuenca in, in Spain, to sort of formulate their, their learning into a set of rewilding principles. I actually had the privilege of um, facilitating this workshop. And the idea is that we don't want to define and tell people what rewilding is, but there are a set of broad principles which can give a steer to how the rewilding approach is expressed. And, you know, I've touched on a couple of these, provide hope and purpose. You know, let's be positive about what we can do. Always link the restoration of nature to solutions or opportunities relating to contemporary society. Once you're restoring ecosystem processes, let nature lead. Don't position rewilding in, comp in competition to the traditional and conventional approach to conservation, which I just illustrated. It's complementary. You know, a lot of the, you know, the, the conservation we've been doing over the last 70 years or whatever, it's been great. It's the source for a lot of the species which will recover. Um, always act in context, um, you know, work together with, with, with others, basically. And think creatively. I think thinking creatively is a, is a key one, which just which just comes through it. So these are the sort of principles which are coming to, uh, if you like, characterize the rewilding uh, approach. 
And generally, when we're doing rewilding, there's, there's three different types of rewilding, if you like. One is what we call passive rewilding, where basically you just take your foot off nature and, and let nature recover and succeed in its own way. Um, this has happened quite a lot in, um, in Eastern Europe, for instance, um, you know, when people left, left the hills after the Second World War and the forests have, have restored and the rock, you know, just grown back and the wildlife has gone back. Um, then there's assisted rewilding, which is actually a very common form of, of rewilding, where you're removing human infrastructure and some human uh, practices, which have sort of forced ecosystems to do a particular thing. This is often, you know, removing barriers from the rivers, removing fences, maybe removing drainage. So the ecosystem processes can sort of re-establish themselves. And this often involves uh, reintroducing uh, functional species or analogues of those functional species, the large herbivores um, I just mentioned. And then there's accelerated rewilding. And this, this can take different forms, but it's really saying, well, you know, we want, if we want to get some of these nature-based solutions, or if we want to, you know, turn rewilding into an ent enterprise opportunities, we need to sort of speed up the, the recovery of ecosystems and steer, steer it in particular ways. So this might be in interventions like particular topographic, um, rest topographic restoration or particular planting designs to, to help, uh, help rewilding uh, get off. And I'll, I'll give some examples of this. So of course, you know, as, as a, you know, as professionals offering rewilding services, we tend to be working a little bit more on the assisted rewilding and accelerated rewilding. And I think this, again, is where there's potentially lovely synergies with, with, with landscape uh, design. Just very briefly, I also want to mention that there's, I think there's increasing synergies between regenerative agriculture and rewilding and some of those principles. At the end of the day, we have the same overarching goal of recovering ecological process to generate value for people and nature and livable landscapes. Often regenerative agriculture is talking about restoring herbivores just as rewilders are. I mean, they talk about mob grazing, we talk about natural uh, grazing. Regenerative agriculture is focusing on, on produce, you know, produce we can eat, whereas rewilding is focusing on the provision of ecosystem services and the revenues they can, can generate in terms of ecotourism or natural capital credits. But increasingly, those two things are, are blurred or coming together, especially with, you know, like in England, we have our new um, sustain, sustainable land management scheme, which is public payments for public environmental, uh, environmental goods. So for me, these, you know, this is a, a nice thing about rewilding is that that historic division, if you like, between environmentalists and, um, and, and, and farmers, uh, we might find some really nice common ground uh, in these new principles. When I was putting together this talk, this is something I've pondered on quite a lot, and, and partly because I used to take my students to, to Stow Landscape Gardens to sort of think about the role of English landscape gardens in, in how we understand uh, you know, modern approaches to, to conservation. And I have been asking myself when I was preparing this talk a little bit, is, you know, is rewilding a modern expression of 18th century landscape gardens, gardening principles and model farms? It seems to sort of have these, these similar themes going through it, you know, notions of, be, of, of becoming something, either becoming something in the landscape or becoming something in, in the social strata. Of othering, you know, this, this thing about landscape gardens came to be because, you know, the, the rest of the landscape was sort of just a formal patchwork, you know, and this idea that actually rewilding is a form of othering because it's creating different landscapes within the broader landscape uh, settings. There's massive amounts of storifying which go on in rewilding. I mean, you know, I showed you those books earlier about the stories of recovery, the walking around landscape um, and being able to interpret it in, in particular ways, you know, if, you're, if you know about rewilding. Um, there's very, very powerful at the moment of the idea of, of rewilding projects being demonstration projects, demonstration projects of new ways of doing uh, things. And then there's, you know, the ideas of discovering, not, not only you know, a lot of rewilding or the engagement with rewilding landscapes. It's a bit like the Japanese gardening um, design where, you know, you go around a corner and you discover something, you know, something opens up, that opening up maybe an encounter with these animals, or it's discovering things you just didn't know, you're just constantly changing and seeing things. And maybe linking to the first one, a lot, a lot of rewilding areas are becoming uh, convening spaces where 
you know, people from different professions come down and, and you know, think about things, progressives from different walks of life or people who are just looking um, at inspiration. One of the approaches we're taking towards rewilding and, and this link with rewilding and, and entrepreneurial landscape design is, is these sort of design principles, which, you know, we're trying to create with rewilding landscapes which are functional and offer nature-based solutions to climate and social change that support meaningful practices of land management and entre entrepreneurship that support this, I just touched on this, this aesthetic of engagement with land, um, with land and generate non-material as well as you know, revenue forms of value. And we use what, a natural asset framework, which is something I developed with colleagues in Brazil, you know, asking these questions about, you know, let's just take stock of where we're at, you know, this rewilding narrative, what forms of value are land currently generating, you know, and for who, you know, what forms of value with, na with nature restoration, rewilding, could they generate and for whom, what forms of value are wanted, you know, um, some of the landowners we're talking about saying, yeah, yeah, we've got to generate revenue, but we actually want to create value which sort of uh, ripples out into the wider uh, wider community and you know often that value is social cohesion or you know the rejuvenation of rural economies or whatever and and something which is always underneath it as well yeah rewilding it sounds great how do you finance it where can that finance uh, come from so just to give you three um uh, just let me check time again yeah running a bit late i beg your pardon three vignettes of of, of this um to give you a flavor of how it's put into practice this is a big scale rewilding project the first i'm going to show is, is the one which i took huge inspiration from and it's in in the netherlands on the dutch delta just outside the city of of nijmegen you may be able to see from this little map at the top that uh, there's a big river, uh, a branch of the Rhine, which comes down. And because of climate change, the flood pulses coming, starting to come down this river were pretty serious. And as you can see, there's a nasty bend which hits the city uh, here. So they needed to do something about it. This is a climate change adaptation project. And they decided to reconnect uh, the river with its washlands and restore the old braided broad river channels which were there so but they also in in the netherlands they had a, a problem with a source of aggregates for building so uh art nature and wwf did a deal with the brick industry and said look we, we won't we won't reject you doing this we'll help you doing it why don't you take out the summer dikes um on it re remove all of the silt and uh, behind it and restore the river braidings so that's how it was financed. It took 25 years uh, over it. And over those years, it went from a three hectare project to a 5,000 hectare rewilding project. And this has, uh, this is a sort of scene of it now, it's generated huge amounts of, of value. One of the key things I just wanted to make is, so the investments were restoring the river braids and channels and introducing natural grazing, putting in some infrastructure like uh, visitor uh, infrastructure, and reintroducing populations of iconic species like beavers and, um, and, and white storks. Two other really important assets came from these processes, uh, came from, if you like, the design of nature. One of them were sand dunes along the river, and another were really diverse um, aquatic habitats. The formation of this new natural asset enabled all sorts of value generating practices, you know, day tripping and so forth, um, rentals, hospitality, new professional services. Um, obviously, there was the brick production, which I've talked about, and produce a whole range of different forms of value. So, you know, for people's, people living in Nijmegen, in all of the mental health and well-being and leisure value you get from going to totally cool natural areas. On the economy and enterprise, there was a lot of, you know, you know nice jobs associated with boutique hotels, the ecotourism economy, and so forth. Uh, professional jobs associated with the, the rewilding and herd management. Um, and then there's a whole set of, of, of value to the, to the city, reduced insurance costs for uh, <laughs> the businesses. Didn't have to invest in uh, you know, flood engineering and a whole lot of regional identity and pride. Nijmegen became the European uh, city of culture, partly because of the rewilding project. So that's a large scale example of rewilding. 
Right at the other side of the scale, uh, this is a little um, a project we've been doing with, with Thames Water, who had a 20 he hectare area of, of, of it was a, an abandoned horse pasture, which they asked us to create a rewilding vision for. And this was really to create a pocket rewilding area as a community asset. But also going back to that point of demonstration, we were commissioned by, by the younger uh, generation within the company. They wanted something where they could start talking about rewilding and demonstrating rewilding principles within their organization uh, there. Here we took a, an accelerated rewilding approach and a, a much more designed approach. So we took inspiration from a key rewilding theory, which is Vera's theory of cyclic vegetation turnover, where he said, at large scales, you get these mo shifting mosaics of grazing areas, um, uh, thickety tree nurseries, copses and groves, and they're in a constant dynamic on it. So we we designed it where we said, well, okay, let's let's accept th this wood pasture. This pasture was it was already rough grassland and and low hawthorn scrub. It'd been abandoned five, for five years. So we just did a design there where we pushed back the some of the areas which weren't going to scrub as fast into meadows. And then we've designed it so we accelerate some of the, the patchy bits into thickets and then plant in other areas, the copses. So you get this sort of mixed dynamic habitat and it'll probably do well, or it could be maintained in that sort of mosaic if we introduce grazing for really quite a number of years. But we've also done this sort of super habitat idea where you know the thickets and copets, copses are different types to give, um, to, to give uh, different forms of value. So it's about using rewilding to create these emergent properties of scent, sound, sight, supply, spaces, which support these value generating practices of chilling out photographic encounters, autumn foraging for berries to make jam or winter foraging for bits to make um, wreaths or whatever, you know, participating in organized activities, places which you can volunteer. So it's just become this community asset where you can do all of these nice practices which generate quality of life uh, value. And then my last example is an Irish example, I'm pleased to say. And this is um, at the, the Castle Leslie estate, which is up on, uh, on the Northern Irish border with, in County Monaghue. And um, it covers about a thousand hectares. And we were commissioned to do this at the beginning of lockdown. So I, I have to say that um, as yet, we've done everything virtually. I'm, I haven't been able to get to go over there. But um, Castle FC is, I mean, it's a really high end and beautiful luxury estate. You know, it's got business about hospitality, authentic in interiors, wonderful old style hospitality, and, um, you know, a wonderful setting for, for outdoor activities. And uh, for many centuries, it's, it's been home of the, the Leslie family who on their website describe themselves as an individual family working with, with, with Sammy Leslie and the team. I, I, I would, they're cultural creatives. I mean, just really creative uh, people and thinking about how rewilding might be able to um, contribute to, to, uh, to really creating a space maybe of, of cultural creativity, but a space which is also, uh, you know, in a state which is, which is um, economically viable. So we're sort of creating this vision or working with them to help create a vision for the estate that blends these rewilding principles with this deep history in the area associated with the ancient kingdom of Oriel to create this space of cultural becoming that is both commercially viable and sustainable uh, in the long term, but has these sort of wider or potentially wider uh, ripple effects. And one of the, I suppose, one of the, from a hospitality side of rewilding, so this, this is more general, not just about Castle Leslie. One of the po points of inspiration we take is this, uh, from actually a technology book by um, Kevin Ke Kelly called The Inevitable. And he asked this really interesting question of, in a world where everything is streamable, copyable, rental, you know, the worlds we're now living in, you can, you can rent a flash Mercedes, you, you can stream your music, all of this thing. What will actually become valuable for people or what is becoming valuable pe for people? And he argues that actually what is becoming valuable, and I think we see this in the music industry, is personalized embodied experiences. You know, previously we would, we would give somebody an album for a, uh, a present or we'd buy one. Now you stream that, it's almost for free, but going to a gig, going to Glastonbury or something, wow, that costs a lot of money. 
And this is a real opportunity for, for nature-based or rewilding-based entrepreneurial activities. That there's the, you know, rewilding gives high quality uh, immersive experiences and it really um, provides a great opportunity for uh, you know, businesses which are based on that or hospitality businesses such as Castle Leslie. And in the Castle Leslie, the Irish, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, case, these sort of experiences, which always have to be based on the seasons, they create the opportunities for people to, to reconnect with the old eight season pagan calendars. And sort of, again, this ideas of othering, moving from all these structures we have in our daily lives through rewild, so to reconnect with, with older rhythms and reconnect connect with landscape and, uh, and history. Um, so, you know, but, I, I suppose I was like, at this talk, I was sort of pushing myself to ask, well, yeah, okay, but is rewilding landscape design something more than just creating experiential landscapes? Is there something more there? And, you know, taking these sort of broad themes of the, you know, the old one, landscape shapes culture, culture shapes landscape. I always also like this quote from, it's a German, from German landscape designers, that the concept of landscape implies continuous interactions. Okay, that's rewilding for me. That's ecosystems for me between natural processes, yeah, and then the human activities and between natural regions and social uh, communities. For me, that's also an, almost another definition of rewilding. But what rewilding posits is that the recovering forces of nature should be co-architects and co-design, co-designers in shaping future landscapes. So it's not just about humans saying, you know, this is the design we should do and that will shape culture, blah, blah, blah. We've got to give nature and empower nature to be part of that future landscape uh, design. And Castle Leslie has got some really interesting challenges here or things to think about. For instance, been quite a lot of passive rewilding since they did the hydrological model modifications. So to what extent should we uh, intervene in that? Should we be resetting the wetland system? You know, we know that um, introducing natural grazing will restore dynamics. But should we be using heritage breeds here to restore those natural dynamics for that connection? I mean, they'll create a great supply of meat for, uh, you know, for, the, for the dining aspect of the, of the business. But will people who come, will they just think, oh, you know, I'm coming down and I'm seeing cows in the landscape? Should we be using a more, there's a whole set of new rewilded, de-domesticated breeds which look wilder? How do we play that one as well? And another one, which I won't go into in too much detail now because I'm running out of time, but the idea about whether we're building in technology into the monitoring right at the beginning so that that technology can offer, um, you know, keep people connected after their, after their visit. So coming to the end of the talk, I hope I've sort of, I hope I've conveyed the idea that I think there's opportunities for rich flows of ideas, expertise, enthusiasm, creative, creativity, between rewilders and people such as yourself, um, landscape uh, designers. Um, and I might say, so, you know, what is rewilding? Come back to that fundamental question. For me, rewilding is an opportunity for the unimaginable to become real. And I have experienced this. Um, if somebody had told me in my 20s that in my 50s, I'll be packing up my car with my family in Oxford and driving to the Netherlands and the next morning we would be tracking down and watching bisons. I think I'd have told that person in my twenties that they were off their rockers, but this is true. This happened two years ago for me, something which I could never imagine and which was absolutely wonderful becoming real in my lifetime. And for me, that is perhaps the promise uh, of rewilding. So I apologize for slightly running over time, but thank you very much. And again, uh, on your behalf, uh, just to thank Paul for his very clear and insightful uh, and very thought provoking presentation and overview on, on rewilding. And um, just before I bring in the questions from the chat uh, and, and just to remind everyone, you can put your questions in the chat and I'll go through them in turn. But uh, what you said, Paul, about uh, grazing really chimed with myself. I work in a parks service in North Dublin and anywhere we've in, introduced grazing into our public parks, uh, the, the public response has been overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly 
positive and, and almost at a, a very deep sort of emotional level in terms of people's res response. And I suppose uh, as against that, a, a grazing uh, uh, and sort of, uh, sort of on the commercial side and beef production and milk production has become, uh, you know, almost a, a negative thing to some degree in, 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 in society with the reputed uh, effects on, uh, you know, greenhouse gases yeah. and all the rest. And I suppose there's that aspect of how we, we uh, how we, uh, correct, you know, get the balance right, as it were, and get the get the message message right. Because I do see it as a as a very uh, uh, you know great option in terms of that species diversity. I know where we've introduced it, you you see almost an, immediately uh, an improvement in the in, in the diversity in the mm -hmm. grassland, etc. But also then squaring the the, the circle. And you re, you've referred to it somewhat uh, uh, in your in your presentation getting that mix right in terms of public access, because a lot of the perception I think that's out there is that when you're going rewilding, that's it. Uh, it's, it's a, you're sterilizing the area uh, in terms of public access. And it's, it's, I don't know what your, your thoughts are in, on, on those two, two issues and getting the, I suppose, getting the mix right and the balance right around, around those messages. Yeah. Yeah, so just very quick, quick response to that. So I think your first bit on this sort of, I don't know, the, you know, the messaging, I suppose, I, I think that for, for me, one of the, the environmental messaging has become very simplified, you know, green is good, you know, vegetarian is, is good and what have you. And actually, the, the, it's, it's really much more nuanced than that. And I think that rewilding and these demonstration projects enables us, you know, we've got people's attention now, it enables us to add Add nuance and um, and sophistication, to, if you like, to the to the environmental uh, narrative. I think the other bit is that is that there's always trade-offs with any, with anything, and I think you know that. I don't know about you guys. I feel that that's what our profession is there for: is to help to manage, design, advise on those trade-offs and um, and 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 find and find the route. Personally, I, I, I don't think that, re, I think rewilding and public access are highly com compatible. For instance, in that Netherlands example I gave you, public access was open, free and ungoverned. It was an opportunity for people to, to rewild. And there was just very simple, um, you know, information given that, you know, they realized that the training needed to be given to know how to approach wilded herds mm. uh, on that. But, um, but generally, um, Generally, I, th I think the two things are highly compatible, actually, of, of public access. Some of it may be paid for exclusive access in terms of the, you know, the experiences, but I think there's opportunities for quite a lot of public access. Yeah, I, li I liked your, your um, I suppose, your connect the connection you made with the 18th century landscape uh, movement. And, and you know, the, the, the key theory underlining that was beauty with utility. And I think you've, you've demonstrated that. Oh, that's nice. That very well. <laughs> so just go on to the questions now, Paul. Uh, so um, you've a couple of thank yous in there, but uh, John Duffy is ask, uh, asking, building building data collection into the story of rewilding projects is so important. Can Paul speak further on how Ecosulis identify key metrics for each product, uh, project and design uh, collect uh, yeah, that, collection uh, protocols. That, that's it, it's quite a long story. Well, it, it, I'm, I'm just thinking how to explain this quickly, but we, we could talk about this offline. And um, we, we're working on Castle Leslie. We're working with a really nice um, uh, ecological consultancy in um, in Ireland, and we uh, we've been really working together on that question. Yeah. Uh, actually, but basically, the the idea is that that. Indicators of ecosystem change. If you're not having to sort of measure the composition, we can be using different types of indicators. So, for instance, we can use more satellite remote sensing. We can use uh, metrics of vegetation structural complexity from drones. And drone imagery tells a great visual story as well for the public. So you, you're sort of doubling up on that. Um, we're starting to look at the use of um, soundscape monitoring, which is becoming affordable very good for sort of you know ecosystem recovery these broad metrics but again they link to 
you know, people can listen to them. They sort of enable all of these other things to do it. So okay. that's sort of a flavor of where we're going. But um, yeah, that's helpful, Paul. Uh, yeah, I, very I happy realize to have a, big, an offline uh, conversation uh, about uh, that with people it's, it's a, I realize it's a big uh, subject. And just going on to Mark Campbell, uh, and, and he asks, was there any negative outcomes arising from rewilding in close proximity to human habitation? I suppose, assume the Dutch experience would be key in that and, and would, would well so yes is the big answer to that so what you have to be really what we really learned from rewilding and i didn't touch on this is how you align rewilding with um animal welfare sentiments and um you know quite rightly or understandably that you know they characterize um certainly they characterize british society and dutch society and if you've got rewilding, and this happened in the Netherlands, which is which is close to urban centres where people aren't really used to seeing death and dying, and if you're allowing uh, you know horses to die, whew, you, know, you you have a big big conflict on your on your hand. So I think that um, I'm not sure you know that's one where we need to be really sensitive to and and, and you know clever and, and there are solutions um, to that. The other ones, of course, about rewilding, but this this is you know is um it's not so much the big herbivores but you know you get other species coming in like badgers or um wild boar in europe this wouldn't happen so much here and they can be absolute hooligans once they start getting into urban areas so there is all of that aspect to manage yeah i had i had heard that about the dutch example and that it was taking you know there's was, was a lot of effort being put into the messaging around that you know? yeah we, rewilding has learned some hard lessons yeah. but that's you know it, it is a le like any new thing it's learning yeah okay. um can, and alistair Ferrer Fer, is asking uh, can rewilding happen in scenarios without large herbivores and if so how do humans t uh, take this role yeah, so a really good one, Alison. And actually, this is what we're thinking about um, quite a lot as a company. So on these pocket sites where, or sites where you can't bring in the herbivores, we have a very gifted um, land manager, Neil, who's, who's really creative at thinking about ways ways we can mimic rewilding. And and sometimes, you know, we some, it's, it's being a sort of slightly incompetent gardener, but, um, you know, you can... Uh, you can mimic some of the effects of herbivores like trampling, like grazing, like stripping trees. I mean, damaging trees a little bit so they don't grow um, um, uh, don't go tall. As I mentioned, we're sort of mimicking the natural processes of thicket formation. Um, you can do that as well by nutrifying particular areas of the land and then planting it. So there are ways, I mean, this is where the creativity comes in, to be honest. There's absolutely ways to do it. I think I think we're at the beginning of that journey, um, and you can't do it all, but you can do you can do an amazing amount of it. And of course, we have to mimic predation as well a lot of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. And uh, William Murphy is asking uh, about potential conflicts with the uh, Habitats Directive in the EU, and um, are are ecologists afraid of rewilding? Great question, and um, I, uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote a policy piece on this about three years ago, and the short answer is yes. Um, so the Habitats Directive is based on that compositionist approach where habitats are specified. So depending on how habitats are specified in terms, you know, you have to maintain favorable condition. So rewilding, particularly on small sites, could damage that favorable condition. On larger sites, which still have ecosystem processes in place, yeah, it's um, it's not as problematic. However, just to say that Rewilding Europe is working quite a lot with the European Commission at the moment to find flexibility in the interpretation of the Habitats Directive to, to en en enable uh, rewilding and actually also to enable uh, natural grazing. So it, it is a tricky, um, a tricky situation, uh, partly because of this, actually, and it goes back to the complementary conservation. It's probably best doing rewilding on non-designated sites um, in it, or even on new sites, because if you have a new site, you know, if it's a degraded site and you're rewilding it, you're outside the, the habitats directive. What we are seeing, though, that, that some when rewilding gets good, there is a tendency for conservationists to want to designate it and the rewilders to say, no thanks, we want to maintain the regulatory flexibility. 
I think that has been I think there has been pushback against rewilding on that basis that it could render the landscape actually more um, likely to be protected. I think I have heard of situations like that. So yeah, and, and again, this is the policy aspect of rewilding is is complex and. Very happy to talk about that in more detail if people are interested. This is my day job. We need a, we need a few hours for that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then Marianne is asking, in terms of choosing which ecosystems we upgrade, what should be guiding this? Given the UN decade of restoration is beginning now, choices need to be made. And just like Castle Leslie being a private uh, uh, select choice related to economic viability. What about the perspective of e ecosystems we need strategically, I suppose, to restore? Is there any? Yeah, that, that, that is a, that's a great question, isn't it? I mean, you know, I'm, I think a lot of the re rewilding ethos is you don't, you're not telling landowners what to do. It's sort of a flow of ideas and, and helping them to think, you know, what forms of value they want to create and for who. And, and again, that's a trade-off between the public value and the private value, which you're already always doing. I think that um, I think what you know what we're talking about in Western Europe a lot is is talking about ecosystems which help natural flood management. Um, so there, you might be you know uh, about restoring washland ecosystems, which give you the adaptive capacity, or um, you know these sort of tussocky, thickety grasslands in the uplands, which just slow water runoff. Mm. So I think that question, actually, the answer to it is quite contextual, um, actually. It depends where you are and what the ecosystem services uh, you may be. Um, you know, in the literature now, there is arguments that, you know, everybody's been talking about climate change. You know, we want to create more trees. But actually, these mosaic habitats may be better in the future because they, they do rapid carbon, uh, soil carbon sequestration, which isn't fully yeah. accounted for. So you might get the, a good mix of it. it. So it's one of those it depends questions, but it's a really good one to be thinking about. Uh, it's, it's a really good question, along with some more that unfortunately we won't be able to get to because of time limitations. And it's a, uh, I suppose it's a tribute to your presentation that we have had such good uh, interaction with the with uh, with our our attendees uh, and just it, we're bang on at 3 p.m now or, uh, sorry uh, 2 p.m i should say um, and so uh, on everybody's behalf paul i'd really like to thank you for your excellent presentation today it's it's really given us a, a whole new uh, opening on to um uh, rewilding and the principles of it and uh, along with you, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, our, our our treasurer Owen O'Brien uh, for for helping to set this up, but also to uh, Anne Doherty, who, as usual, has been excellent in sorting out all of the technology and the invitations. And uh, it's great to see so many people attending. And thanks again, Paul. And I hope we will be able to welcome you uh, uh, on this side of the the uh, the, the the sea. Fairly I can't soon. wait. We're, we're checking the uh, guidance every week. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I think it's. Uh, I think you get the. You get over fairly soon to, yeah. to lovely Castle Leslie. So um, uh, take care, everybody, and see you in a fortnight's time for our next presentation. So, bye, thank everybody, you. and thanks thank again, Paul. Yeah, cheers.